looking for. So, yeah, without further ado, please, uh, Maurizio and Tiago, maybe you can start introducing yourself and then uh, we can go into questions and answers. Okay, I'll try to be brief here, but uh, just answering your question, uh, you know that the, the fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. It's very true in my case because I, I, my family is a family of uh, engineers or, and scientists. And I went to art school because, you know, my mother likes uh, drawing and paintings and things like that. But uh, I always, I, I don't see the, the, these two fields disconnected. If you look at the Renaissance, you will know what I'm talking about. But uh, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of, my mind works, I see aesthetics in math, for instance, so for me they're one and the same. And Konomi was uh, a very generous school for me in that way, because people are so kind and, you know, I talk to great uh, researchers and professionals, so I end up learning a lot. So that's it. But uh, from a more professional career perspective, uh, I am with Konomi since the very beginning, and both me and Tiago are, you know, we are partners of Konomi. So, uh, yeah, we're very, very close tied to Konomi. And that's it. Thanks. Yeah, cool. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned, I am engineering information. I, I, I uh, have a bachelor in uh, computer engineering. And uh, in the beginning of my master's, uh, which I uh, I was in the, this university here in Belo Horizonte, uh, I met one of the founders of Kunumi, which is the professor Nivio. Uh, he was one of my teachers. And uh, the, the economy was uh, only at the beginning then it had like three months of uh, which had, that had begun and um, he invited me to to work with with the, the company and uh, I always had this interest in data and data science back then uh, I, I was only beginning to learn but since then in this past five years this was uh, around 2016 uh, in the past five years, I've been working on, on several uh, projects uh, as a data scientist. Uh, I've worked in, um, for example, in several industries, for example, in a financial market, uh, developing a uh, credit score model for a, a digital bank. Uh, I also spent a lot of time in the, the health in the health insurance company, uh, which we developed a lot of, lots of uh, solutions for them uh, that range from uh, risk prediction analysis uh, to uh, normally detection and automation in their, uh, their evaluation process for medical assistance. And uh, in the past year, I've been working on an internal project in Konumi uh, that we were developing some tools and frameworks uh, to uh, accelerate the development of commercial projects. Uh, this, is actually, this is the project that I was working directly with David. Uh, he helped me a lot in this one. Uh, and recently, uh, I was uh, invited to uh, become the, the CTO of Konomi, and now I'm actually managing the, the whole engineering team. So uh, to be able to talk about uh, uh, technique and more technical stuff is actually a joy for me right now. <laughs> And uh, I don't know, I have a, a brief presentation of Konomi here. Would, would you like me to, to go through it? Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Okay, so... Um, about Konumi, uh, we now have over 100 people that are all compassionate critical thinkers. Uh, 
this this means that we have this uh, amazing uh, sharing culture we we share a lot of our beliefs a lot of uh what we learn what we read what we are we are doing and uh what we've been working on and we also have uh over 60 researchers in 60 institutions here in brazil uh, we have a lot of partnerships with uh, universities such as the one i came from that i mentioned uh, and over those years we've uh, developed uh, more than 100 uh, projects, systems, and frameworks. And uh, Konumi is actually the, the fourth company in, in a series of companies founded by the same uh, group of entrepreneurs, uh, which comes from the, started in the 90s with this company named Miner, uh, that was, uh, I believe what this was a meta search company, uh, which was found uh, inside the university, uh, this, UFMG, which is the university here in Belo Horizonte. Uh, then came Nimu, uh, which was uh, an e-commerce company. And then came Aquan, uh, which was a search engine and which was then acquired by Google. And as Mauricio uh, said, uh, this is actually the reason why the, the main Google office is in, in Brazil is here in Belo Horizonte because it came actually from a company founded by the same people that then found Konumi. And uh, all those four companies, they they have something in common that they had the same goal, which was to reduce the the, the gap between what was, what was done in, in the university, what is, is done in research, and what's actually done in the industry. So we always had this this bridge between uh, research and, and, and development and, and industry. And um, we, the way we've done this since the 90s was through data, data mining, data uh, knowledge, man, data science. Uh, and Konomi is the first one that's actually 100% artificial intelligence company. And well, uh, our purpose is uh, to bring this technology and the, the prosperity that comes with it uh, to as many people as possible uh, through a responsible development. And we, we have a, a few principles, but I believe the, the most important one is what is called now uh, human-centered AI, uh, because we are developing machines, uh, but we cannot forget that the whole point of doing that is to improve uh, the life of humans, the quality of life, to solve problems for humans. That's what we call a life-centered worldview. And well, we all Not know the... <laughs> That's important because uh, to uh, when you compare a machine and a human, it's important to look at the human, but uh, we know that we need to look beyond the humans in order to ba rebalance our planet. So that's what we're trying to, to approach at this time, engaging more uh, social environment projects using AI. Exactly, thanks. Um, and well, the, the world is full of complex problems. Uh, there are many, many more problems that we as a single company are able to solve. And that's why uh, we believe that uh, everyone should be able to answer complex questions, to try to solve uh, complex problems that uh, affects them directly. And that's why uh, we've been developing this platform that uh, we are trying to create abstractions over the, the data science slash machine learning uh, process to enable people, uh, more uh, non-technical people, to, to solve their problems uh, by increasing this abstraction uh, each time more. Uh, currently, we have a tool that can be used by data scientists and by programmers, even if they, are, uh, they don't fully understand machine learning. Uh, but as we develop this more and more uh, we are aiming to achieve a end user soon 
and in time our goal is to have uh, such a, a simple tool that even kids uh, should be able to use it and uh, create solutions for the, them on. And well, um, in the past few years, as I said, uh, we, we developed a lot of uh, applied solutions for industry and a lot of research. And our goal was always to reduce the gap between those two worlds. And the way that we've been doing this so far is to use the, the, the solutions, the, 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 the problems that we solve to fund the research and uh, to revert the revenue uh, from these commercial projects into research. And the research uh, gives us uh, tools and, and of course knowledge that actually uh, enables us to create more products and more sol and solve more complex solutions and that's why that's how we we create this cycle between the industry and, and the research and that's when causality comes in because um, in all those those problems that we've solved in most of the research that we've done uh, we've noticed that machine learning is all about correlation uh, and there are a few questions that correlation by itself cannot solve. And we, we all know that machine learning is a very powerful tool. Uh, we can solve a lot of problems using it, and we can get a lot, lot of insights and discover new things, but uh, it has a, a limitation of, that it's built in on those correlations. Uh, questions, for example, as, um what's directly impacting on my target variable or uh, and what's actually useful and what what's actually noise and uh, how is the the variables in a data set related to each other uh sometimes looks like we can solve this by using correlations but we are actually just mirroring uh, a noisy uh, process and, and the whole point of, of uh, doing causality research is to go deeper into these problems and to actually try to understand what's generating the data and how the real world uh, behave uh, that creates that data. And this is uh, uh, very new uh, in, in, in the field. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know many tools that are able to do this uh, in the way that we have a lot of tools that are able to do uh, machine learning, but not as many that are able to extract causal uh, inferences from data. Uh, that's why we thought that was this was one interesting challenge. And uh, by doing this, we we can achieve uh, a, a, a real, real mod, machine learning models that are really good that they have high accuracy and uh, they are stable and they have uh, low noise because once we can actually understand the process that generates the data and understand what are the the, the proxies on a, on a causal graph and uh, what how the the variables are related to each other we can eliminate most of the noise of a machine learning uh, model and then we can achieve uh, much more complex and much better solutions for what the, uh, we are developing. And well, that's it. <laughs> that's the, the presentation I would like to do. Great. Thank you so much. And I will open it now. Uh, if Mauricio, if you want to add anything, just you can add. But then I will open it the floor to also the trainees. You can ask any questions. Uh, to Maurizio and Tiago. Yes, well, uh, I would like to do just a brief uh, speak about causality and yeah. in specific, but uh, I, will, I will be brief. The questions are the main, the main goal here. So, uh, well, these things that Tiago is saying is interesting because uh, when you look at a model and you, and you try to measure uh, overfitting. In fact, what we are trying to measure is, is to know if the model 
had model the data or on the phenomenon. And when we start to investigate it from a causal point of view uh, and to select variables from this perspective and things like that, we have a, a much higher chance to model the phenomenon instead of the data. So uh, that is the, the main reason why we're interested in, in causation, in causality. Even if uh, our clients still demand uh, machine learning. But there's uh, something else, and that is, uh, I don't know if you got, the, if you found uh, the concept of uh, the ladder of causality. Uh, and I will post a link yeah, here. Yeah. And uh, it's a very interesting concept, and it's it separates uh, three levels of questions that we can ask for the data to the data. So it's important to take a look. There is a, a I don't know in page six from this document I just posted. You can see. Uh, let me share my screen. It's it's faster. Mm -hmm. That's the, the uh, illustration I was talking about. And it's very clear about uh, the distinction between the kinds of questions that each level is able to respond and what is needed to respond these kind of questions. And from a business perspective, it's, it's way too common to see people asking questions about layers number two or layer number three and trying to answer it with uh, techniques of uh, level one. So that's that's. Uh, if I had to say, please please learn something today, it will be please learn this image. So uh, that's my contribution to the to this point. So now, please uh, ask us the questions you want. Great. Thank you so much. Actually, we touched about, like, in the first day, I explained about this uh, scene doing in counterfactuals, but it's, I haven't, uh, haven't seen that picture, so thank you. This is actually, this makes it, I was much more referring it in the kind of equation of um, language, like how in a language that the structures develop, but this is quite another way of uh, looking. I mean, it's very nice. I, I, I like it. So, yeah, so now we are open. So anyone from the trainees, please just ask your questions, whatever you have been struggling, either it has been a you know, bigger picture or some you know, kind of local phenomena, conceptuals, just open for questions. And you can raise your hand and um, you can unmute yourself. So I will start with one. Just uh, so when when I think of this causality in the sense in Bayesian statistics, you have the prior was the main innovation, I would say, or what why sometimes um, from frequentist and and Bayesian sense, like you, you have a way to include some kind of like prior information in a very natural way. And that gives it much more power, like um, because then you know the calculus changes. Here I am seeing now you can also change not only that, but also you can put your assumptions, like things that that are basically. So how do you say it? Is it is it, is it correct to say like is it the expansion? Like let's say like we have statistical. So going from statistical to causal, it's much more of the generalization. Why they have this? power as a statistical, but then you, you like you kind of include another dynamics, which is kind of a mechanism to, uh, to put your assumptions, and then you get this causality. Do you see that kind of order, or you know what, what do you think uh, about that, it's between this causality and statistical distinction? Well, uh, from my point of view, uh, I completely agree with you. Uh, 
uh, we when you think about a causal model a causal uh, yeah, for instance, what we are doing in fact we are saying oh I know or I be, I think I know how this phenomenon unveils in reality so you draw a graph and you can attach numbers and, and arrows to this and you can perform calculations in a much more uh, sophisticated way and you don't have to work only with aggregates you can you know split the data in a, in a more uh, refined way so it's a it's a uh, mathematical technique and language in order to in order for that allows you to better express your view of reality and what's beautiful about these techniques that uh, Judea introduced is that data can help you to uh, refute your hypothesis in fact when you draw a, a causal graph you're just making explicit hypothesis about a phenomenon and data can test it and can prove or disprove your hypothesis. So I think it's a very powerful tool for science thinking. Yeah, uh, I think what Maurice is trying to say is that uh, usually it's more important to look at the edges that are not in the graph than the ones that are in the graph. Because, uh, well, uh, I, I, yes, I, I believe that this is a uh, an evolution of the, the the Bayesian way of thinking, because yes, we, we, you have your priors, you have your, your biases, um, and now you're trying to look at the cause and not only the the, the, the correlations. And, uh, and you you when you create a graph, you usually have some some expectation over it, and you say like, oh, I understand a little bit about this process, and I think this variable is related to this one, and this one is related to that one. And sometimes it's interesting just to confirm that. But when you believe there is a, uh, 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 an edge that uh, means a sort of connection, a, a cause, and this doesn't show in the, the, the final graph, this doesn't show in the, the final relationship between the variables, and I think that's when you get the most insights. That's when you, you notice that you believe in something that the data cannot show you that there is. And that's very interesting. Fantastic, thank you. So, any question? Yeah, so Deborah has a question. Is there a way to make a causal graph without having an expert knowledge about the correlation between the variables? Yes. Uh, well, uh, I don't know, maybe Maurice can explain it better, but uh, the way that we've done this is by brute force, <laughs> uh, basically trying uh, all the combinations between three variables and seeing if the we can detect if they, they form any type of connection uh, between those three variables. So uh, this works great if you're, you don't have too many variables, but, uh, since it's a brute force approach, uh, it's, it's limited. Well, uh, I will start uh, asking, complementing Thiago's answer to Deborah, and then I will, I will go to Smash. Sorry if I misspelled your names. <laughs> but, uh, well, the first one is exactly what Thiago said. Uh, in the, in the, uh, in the theoretical framework, they assume that you, you're going to, the first step is to propose a graph, and then you use data to validate the graph. But in some cases, and we don't have an initial theory about it, so uh, we said, okay, let's assume a fully connected graph and use the technique to, to use data to validate the graph to remove some of these edges, and then we're going to look at what has survived and see if it makes sense. But it gives this, this approach doesn't give you any guarantees about the validity of the final graph because it's limited to what data can refute. And if data is incomplete, the data 
will probably the graph the final graph will probably be uh, wrong or partially wrong so uh, I don't think there's a way to extract a perfect causal graph from data alone uh, well and the second about the the chain of cows it's, it's very interesting because uh, when I was starting to to speak with my professor Adriano and, and I said exactly the same thing if we go back we're going to go back 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 until the Big Bang <laughs> because <laughs> well it was the original cause but for practical terms uh, I think we can uh, limit ourselves to the questions we are trying to answer and it's very common in a, in a causal graph that you have some nodes and you have a special node that is like all the other variables I am not seeing or I'm not measuring so it, it's a way to work with that Diego, if you want to add also at any time, you, you are welcome. And so I, I'm just assuming that you are seeing the questions, so you can follow oh, okay. up. Okay. Yeah, yeah uh, about the set, second questions. Uh, uh, it's very complicated when you have a cycle like this, because yes, one thing is causing the another. And uh, well, I, I, I'm with Mauricio. If you find the third variable that is actually causing both you can uh, break the cycle. That's your stopping point. And the the bad news is this this uh, is usually not in the data. This is a hidden factor. Uh, but well, I think the in the the cycle the data can show you there is a cycle, and this should be valuable by itself. Uh, so uh, the next question: To what extent are companies willing to believe that there is not strong enough? Um, this is actually quite easy to convince the companies uh, because uh, maybe it's hard to convince that it's not not enough to prove causality. But we've uh, we've reached a lot of points where the data was not enough. For example, to build a machine learning model, and uh, we we could show them that uh, we tried a lot of techniques, we tried a lot of data engineering, data cleaning, and data processing and simply the problem was the, the way they collect the data so when you, sh you show the company that they've been collecting the data the wrong way and for the wrong way i i, I mean that for example sometimes is a, a a spreadsheet that someone uh inputs manually the variable the value uh, the value uh like once an hour and this uh since it's a manual process uh that goes over a long time uh it's obviously that at some point there's going to be mistakes there's there are going to be uh uh wrong numbers or uh wrong times or maybe it's not measured at all and if the data is not good enough for machine learning is not good enough for causality so uh, i think the, the the tricky part is okay we can do machine learning with this data but it's not enough to show the, the, the there is causality. Maybe uh, if we build a, a causal graph with this data, what you're seeing is like a, a huge mess, <laughs> a cloud of, of edges. And, and uh, even the experts can understand the graph. So this should be, uh, this should indicate that the data is not good enough. Um, okay, so moving on. I don't know, Maurice would like to comment on this one. I was just answering uh, some other questions of, on text, but uh, uh, about the company, it's, it's interesting because uh, it depends on the maturity level of the company we, you're dealing with. Uh, there are companies that uh, uh, are not used to a b testing for instance or you know uh, you have to know who you're dealing with so uh it's a learning in, in a teaching process because um 
in the end, they are interested in the results, and the results are grounded in reality. So if you are able to prove them that what you're saying is true by showing a result of one action against another action, in the end they are convinced. But you have to be aware that it's a uh, it's more <laughs> about uh, teaching and helping them to change the culture of the company to be more data driven, to more uh, objective and scientific than uh, the other way around. They are interested in the results, and if you show them that what you're saying will help them to achieve better results, they will agree with you. So there is Kumbani's question as well. So it is, if I, uh, so if I get correctly, for me, uh, causal graph is a trial and error uh, part. Is that, is that so? That's a question. Yeah, that's what uh, I was starting to answer. And the answer is yes and no, because as I said, when you have someone that has a strong belief, it's better to express this belief in, form, in the graph, uh, in the causal graph form and validate it, check it with data. And uh, that's the most straightforward way to do. But there are some situations where we don't know the phenomenon or there uh, divergence is about what is right or what is wrong. So in this case, you can either draw more than one graph and validate them and see which one better fit, better fits the data. Or you can try our approach that is, as Tiago well defined, brute force approach. So let's assume all possibilities and see what remains. Uh, this is what we create to have. I believe that uh, in the in the near future we are going to have uh, better tools and maybe some heuristics, so we don't have to use brute force. Like I said, I think this is we are only at the beginning of this this research field. Um, then there is another very, in my view, very interesting question. How? Do you take you know how how do you use the model to confirm or to conform or refute or update a pre-proposed causal graph that was based on assumption or an expert knowledge? Okay. Well, uh, the specific techniques are uh, well described in the book I just posted, but uh, in in the end, uh, you have uh, look. You should look at the causal graph. You see, you, and you look at the at triplets, you can see there are only three possibilities. Imagine that, let me, let me draw it, it's going to be right, sorry. Imagine if you have a variable A, B, and C, okay? In this case, we are going to, if, you, if you, your graph is telling A causes B, B causes C, we are seeing at a uh, what they call a mediator. In this case, C is a B is a mediator. There are two other possibilities: A, B, C. This part of the graph is saying B is a confounder because it causes both A and C at the same time. And there's the last possibility that is. In this case, B is a collider. So uh, if you measure the, cor the correlation between A and B, oh, I'm sorry, in between A and C, and compare it with the correlation between A and C, but in this case, uh, how is the name, Thiago? Uh, conditioned by B. When you compare conditioned and non-conditioned correlations, you you the data can can tell you what you're looking at. Either you're looking at a collider or you're looking at one of the others. So 
in this way you can see uh, if the the arrow you're trying to prove is likely or unlikely to be correct i'm not sure if my explanation was <laughs> was good enough so i i bet yababo can help uh, with the English. yeah I, I think it's really uh, in my opinion that's that answers but just maybe an explanation for some they might not distinguish between what is the graph and then the post process which is that you have to compute actually the conditionals uh, which is actually that's coming from the data so the graph is a prescription of the relationship and then you actually then use the data so that's the graph is kind of telling you what you know what relates to what and then you are computing from the data actually you know using basically the conditionals and all types of correlations condition on, on multiple things and that will lead you that's exactly where you prove or refute actually so there are two steps one is constructing a graph which is basically a simple our assumption and then the second is the actual formula or the calculus that involves exactly what Maurizio is explaining um, that you have to compute whether it's this or whether it's that condition on multiple things and then there is a calculus for that that um, that you then can ask. So I think that the two-step process allows you to to actually kind of gain more insight from the data or refute from the data. But the first yeah, part is more of the graph, which is much more yeah. of the relationship. Yeah, and in fact, there is a third possibility. Once you you trust your graph enough, you can use it use it as. A, to answer more uh, questions from level two or from level three. So, for instance, to answer a question from level two, you have to change the graph in order to express uh, the intervention you're doing with your question. So, the first and second steps are, their objective is to make sure the graph is as good as possible. And when you're, you're confident enough, you can start to make calculations. So uh, one example is uh, what, happen, what will happen if I change vari uh, variable B to a specific value? In order to do that, you have to sever the graph, the graph from the arrows that are pointing to the variable that you are manually changing the value because that's exactly what you're doing the cause of this value is your intervention it's not the other variables that could change the value of this one so uh, that is one use of the the graph once it's matured and with the new graph you can calculate the probability of something happening yeah. I think yeah, just that the likelihood thing is there, so you can check the likelihood. So just that the refutal or whatever that uh, Daniel you are asking comes in that how likely it is, just um, that part of the number. But if it is not clear again, probably please anyone you can also ask it, re ask it, such that it, it gets clear. But we can go on unless you have. Uh, so, and then another one is quite more on, on Konami, I think. Uh, is it like you work, sounds really magic. So can you tell us, you know, some example, real world social benefits um, to, of any example? Uh, yes, uh, I think we have two projects that uh, serve as good, as good examples. Um, uh, the first one is a, ICU project that we we developed to start long ago with with research and now it has become a product. And what it does is that we we collect a lot a lot of data from ICUs, uh, which are intensive care units. So there are people there uh, which are not uh, good uh, in good health conditions, and as they are monitored closely, uh, they generate a lot of data. And when we were uh, working on the research, uh, along with uh, doctors and the medical staff, uh, they said, like, 
uh, it's too much data to to evaluate and too many patients and we use machine learning to create this system uh, that can uh, show to the to to the doctor the the, the medic the, the the physician that is treating those patients uh, how is the the risk uh, of that patient uh, and this, this risk could be associated for example uh, as a death risk and which basically tells how bad the patient is uh, but also it could be like uh, how long the patient is going to stay in this hospital but this in a very intuitive way uh, that comes with also explanations uh, so uh, just to uh, make it clear uh, this is not talking about uh, causality yet we are using uh, explanations such as uh, SHEP uh, so it's just explaining a model uh, but it gives the doctor uh, a priority of the patients, uh, intuitive way to see those patients uh, and what are making them ill. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, a well-trained doctor already knows this and, and should not need a machine learning tool. But the actual benefit from this is that the, the doctor can uh, prioritize better the, the patients and it's not uh, overwhelmed by all those variables and, and all the factors. And this uh, has an impact both on the, the quality of the life of the doctor and the quality of the, the treatment. So it impacts the, the quality of life of uh, the people staying in the, in the ICU. Uh, and one other project that we, we've done uh, I think was the beginning of this year. Uh, it was with a, a huge company that uh, uh, that treated water. So they they have this station for water treatment, and they use a lot of chemicals. And uh, the output of this station uh, uh, fueled uh, a nearby city. And the problem is that they needed help to control. The, the chemicals that they were uh, using on this water. So, for example, uh, if they put a lot of chemical, uh, the, the water was unusable for the town. And of course, this uh, also harms the, the environment. Uh, but if they use uh, uh, only a few, uh, two little chemicals, uh, they would also, the water was still dirty, so people couldn't drink. And um, of course, this again has an impact on the environment. And we've developed a reinforcement learning model that learned to control the output of the, the, the chemical, um, how much chemical would actually go into the water by analyzing the, the previous data with the, the experts that define this value, these values. And uh, this model is now running in a production environment in, for this company. And it tries to uh, achieve that uh, sweet spot that there's not too, mu too much chemical and not too few chemical. Uh, so the water has a good quality for the, the, to fuel the, 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 the town and everyone can drink it safely, uh, but also to not harm the environment too much. Uh, I think those are, I don't know if this, those yeah. are good examples, but sounds like. Uh, yeah, thank you so much actually for giving us the, the detail. I hope that answers. So if we just, because we are running out of time, I'm just, I would move to the next one. So maybe like, so the question is clear, but maybe Sumesh, do you wanna unmute? And also would be nice to, to hear the voice of the trainees instead of just only text. So maybe can you ask the questions, Mensch, like with uh, by unmuting? And also the next question, Elias, if you could do that, that would be great. I know, but it's already probably answered, but if it's not answered, maybe you can, but Mensch. Hmm. Thank you. Good afternoon. So my question is, so for casualty, I have read, so there are three three conditions then one of the condition is so controlling the third variable 
So in Daiso, that correlation is used to control the influence. So I mean the the influence of the third variable. So I I have a question that is, do you think that it's enough just using correlation to control the third variable, or is there any other tool so which helps us to control the third variable? Yes, that's a very interesting question because in the book, uh, uh, Perot says that the traditional statistic statisticians, I'm not sure if that's correct, uh, they believed that uh, control you should control every single variable. But uh, in fact, it depends on the causal graph. When you control a variable, you can have uh, two effects you can either reduce the correlation between two other variables or you can increase the correlation between two other variables and it depends on the the, the mediator confounder or collider uh, relation between them so uh, controlling variables is not a, a silver bullet you ha we have to use it with care so that's why uh, this group of researchers uh, develop the, the causal graph and the do operator in order to uh, accommodate, to express mathematically uh, this reality. So that's a, that's, a, that's a very important point. And I, I strongly suggest that you dive, uh, dive as deep as you can into it. Okay, do you want to add Tiago or should we go to the next one? It, so Mensch, if it's not answered, then we could also, we can also ask it again. Um, or is that okay? Does that yeah. answer your question? Thank you. Okay, so yeah, the, maybe can you comment then on feature reduction and you know feature engineering and other related things that you should do before or one should do and why probably you should do before you know generating a graph or applying the data to compute things well uh, if you were you're trying to solve uh, using the brute force uh, it, uh, the number of variables is determined in the feasibility of the computation because uh, it increases exponentially. So uh, you have to restrict yourself, I don't know, to something less than 200 variables or something like that. But uh, if, you're, if you're trying to follow the, the Pearl's uh, suggestions, you would have to deal with even less because uh, it's it's complicated to think about the relations of, I don't know, like 30 variables. I usually see causal graphs using 5, 6, 10 at most uh, variables. So. Uh, and probably it's going to be enough because we know uh, mo think about uh, causality in general uh, we it's not common to have 10 variables influencing one because this uh, there's you know the cause is more concentrated in most of the cases so i don't know uh, I'm speculating here, but I think it makes sense uh, from a lot of different points of view. So yeah. I will try to reduce. Uh, just uh, one comment. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I understood correctly the question. Uh, what Marisa is saying is uh, more like feature selection and, and just choosing some variables to create the causal graph which, yes, it actually makes a lot of sense if you choose carefully. Uh, but if uh, feature reduction, uh, you're thinking about something like uh, PCA or SVG, 
which actually reduces the the dimension into uh, some other space. Um, I I don't know how this would actually um, uh, come back to the actual variables later. So doesn't look like a good idea but on the other hand looks like a promising way to explore to reduce this um, uh, brute force approach because you would have like uh, when we do dimensionality reduction you eliminate a lot of noise but you create new features that doesn't mean anything to us uh, and maybe if you can do the the other way around and, and from this space come goes back to the original features and bring the, the causality with this with this transformation. Yeah, it could be interesting to explore this way. So yeah, and that's, that's, that's something uh, I would like to add uh, about feature selection. So one of the uses we are experimenting here in Psychonomy is to use this brute force approach to uh, do the, the feature selection. Because if you have a graph, it may not be the perfect graph, but you can look at your targets and use only the variables that are pointing to your target. And if this graph is somehow correct, uh, it's likely that your final model will be more stable because the, in theory, you, you are using only the, the variables that contribute to the cause. So you have less proxies and less noise and things like that. Sorry, I was mute. So Deborah, do you want to also mute and ask? Or is it already answered? OK. Yeah, I think it's already answered. OK. OK, so we are running, like, at least the one hour is uh, coming to the end. But if anyone has a question, you, you know, your question is not answered, or you, you want further explanation, you still have two minutes. So you can ask. And while people are asking, I also have one question. Where do you think we will be in this sense, like in, let's say, five, 10 years? Because if the same question were asked about deep learning in 2011, probably people would have a very different perspective, would differ than you know, if they were asked in 2013. Right, just or like in the, in that era where like something is kind of humming and dominant and demonstrated, and the same. Do you think similar? Like, are we are we gonna see some, you know, a lot of activity? I see that there is a lot of even packages that are coming to deal with this thing, some tools. But you know, what is your perception given that you have been exploring reading uh, on this area? Yeah. Um, oh, I think that we we should see uh, a lot of improvement in what we do with structured data because uh, at least and in the near future, maybe five years most, uh, because for data uh, like uh, text and images, uh, we are advancing real quickly uh, with machine learning and we have a lot of interesting models in that that way and maybe causality is not interesting in that area yet so but on the other hand on structured data uh, as we advance the the, the knowledge about uh, causality how to create those causal graphs and develop tools what i believe that is that we eventually are going to figure out a way to uh, create predictions and inference uh, on top of this graph so maybe we are going to have some new kind of models that are, are not uh, based on, on the, the classical statistics, that, let's put it this way, uh, for example. Uh, today we, we saw a lot of problems using boosting and, and trees, uh, which is basically linear algebra. Um, but maybe we, in the future, are going to have models built on top of this causal graph that are going to be uh, uh, 
much more interesting, uh, much better for solving those type of prob problems, and that they are going to enable uh, what Maurice was saying on that ladder. They are going to enable us to solve uh, questions at level two and three, uh, and, and to uh, uh, make questions like, what if I do this? What's the outcome? That we, some people think we can uh, answer today, uh, but it's kind of still dangerous to do that because the way correlations work, like you can uh, assume that's working, but it is actually not. Uh, so this is the, the near future for me and, and the long future, maybe 10 years, we are going to move to the other way and try to understand the causes on natural language processing and image recognition, which is, I think it's uh, much deeper uh, and much uh, involves a lot of new research and like uh, medical research and, and psychological research. Um, and well, it also has a lot of potential. Maurizio, do you wanna add? Uh, no, but I'm sorry, I was answering the next question. So I, yeah, no, it, it's fine. I was much more like, what is the near feature and long, you know, uh, more extended feature, future, not feature, <laughs> uh, of the field. And uh, so again, I think to just make it clear, I think our trainees know the purpose of this this week was much more to get familiar with this and to, to really start thinking about the, you know, the very core of statistics and the philosophy and which I think understanding of this will help anyone understand any other thing, in, in my opinion. So it's like all of the machine learning, AI and everything relates to this dichotomy between causality and you know why something works is because it somehow is mirroring reality. Why something doesn't work is because it's learning some garbage. So it's that garbage is basically you know, like the thing. So I, that's why I'm, I think this working on that, even if it's not a mainstream, I think this is very key. And that's why it's a kind of a good experience. But at the same time, I also feel that designing a causal graph is something similar to architecture design in deep learning. And there is very similarity, at least from my point of view, that as soon as that thing is kind of taken care of through different methods, for example, I was reading this paper, uh, no tears, it's the, converting it into much more of a continuous variables instead of searching for a graph, which allows for, you know, that you can compute on, on much larger variables. I think when these methods come, there might be a much more like a merge between the two probably. I think I don't see any reason why we should just we will not have deep learning of causal on causal graphs. Um, so that's where I feel maybe there's also a very big hope that as we invent something like like that will make it easier. Yeah, uh, I think that the, this is central in order to. It's, it's closely related even to topics that are hot in machine learning, like ethics or uh, bias or things like that. Because you, if you look only at the data, you're looking at the past and you're looking at what happened in the world, the way the world was configured at this time. So uh, if you're trying to you cannot expect a model to be fair if you're just telling him learn from our past and our past is not fair so you have to uh, to think about what you're doing and causality helps you to do that to uh, reflect about what you want to amplify because uh, for me that's the key point around causality you have to you know a machine helps you to do something you already know how to do 100 times faster so you have to be certain that you're doing something you believe and that's the key point for me yeah you have a connection dropped so i um 
so while he's not here, I can hijack the discussion, which I'm happy about, um, because I don't really understand causality. But I would love to know, um, I mean, many of our trainees here, uh, you have a bell's back. Now no, I go on, go on, Arun, continue. We can I, was just, I was just admitting to my ignorance of statistics, and then you came back. <laughs> That's causality. I was going to ask a question, and then you came back. No, so um, just proceed. I'm just kidding. Um, so we have a lot of software engineers and people from different backgrounds. This get, this sounds like very hard math. Um, how do you make the case for why this is relevant? And is this, uh, well, I'll, I'll stop there. Why is this relevant? Why is this important? I'm sorry, I, I, I couldn't got the, the question right. I was asking, how do you make the case for why um, this statistically intensive approach, establishing causality, is important? Well, in fact, uh, it's uh, the causality uh, field is somehow uh, questioning the traditional statistics field, it, it's expanding it. So if you look back in history, you see that uh, it's completely focused on correlation and controlling variables in order to avoid spurious, spurious correlations or crash. <laughs> but uh, what uh, this group is, is telling us is that you don't have enough tools if you look only at the traditional statistics. You have to create new math. You have to create a new technique. And that's, uh, in fact, they are doing it to challenge the status of the, the statistics. And the example I was talking about in the, in the chat about tobacco, uh, there was, that were as many research research papers, scientific papers telling that tobacco was good, uh, was related to cancer, and as there was a, a 20, like 20 years the academic were discussing and that there was no language or precise enough to describe the problem. And that's why the answers were just so you have there was no no clear winner because the correct the questions were not posed in a precise enough way so that's what that's the main contribution of causal graphs and the dual operator in my opinion they expand the possibilities of application uh, relating related to to statistics So, well, guys, the discussion is very good. I'm sorry, but I, will, I have another appointment. Yeah. Uh, I can try to answer new questions the, as best as I can. Uh, yeah, in, it was in, really, in, thank you. I just, I just want to say, say thank you. And it was really useful and um, taking the time and also helping us design the chat. So thank you so much. Well, um, thank you guys for the opportunity. I hope this uh, is helpful in some way. And I'm really, really curious to see what the students are going to to deliver. So uh, yeah. I'm eager to see their work. So Maritza, before you go, we have a rule that if anyone calls our trainees students, they have to tell a joke. Because we have trainees, we don't have students. Oh, so sorry. We have, to, we have to be strict. <laughs> And we want to hear a joke from your part of the world, unless you really have to go. If you have one minute, we would love to hear a joke. <laughs> Jesus, let me think about some. I don't know, Tiago, can you uh, pay my my punishment, please? <laughs> uh, this is very hard. Uh, make jokes in English. Uh, I don't know. Um, yeah. Uh, I I like vegetable jokes, but uh, I don't know any vegetable jokes. So 
if you guys know some just let us know <laughs> okay sorry about not paying my punishment mm -hmm. i really have to go <laughs> thank you so much Maurizio, and thank you so much Diego. it was really very nice discussion thank you so much for your time thank you guys bye, bye guys thank you very much